What is up, Indian Heads? As you can see, the green screen behind me is actually green today. And that's because today I won't be showing you any animations or graphs. Instead, today we're doing a big update on Project Underdog, which is a turbo build of my Toyota MR2 Mark 1. Now, as you can see, the bike carbs from my old engine are in my hand, which means that they're not in the engine bay. Actually, there's nothing in my engine bay right now, and that's because the old engine is out. And today I also want to do a big recap on my old engine, the bike carb for a GE engine. I want to talk about the pros and cons uh, and my impressions and feelings on this engine and bike carb conversions in general after owning this engine for more than two years and driving more than uh, I think around 5,000 kilometers with it. So not a, not a lot of mileage, but all of the miles, miles, kilometers, whatever, uh, were enthusiastic driving kilometers so i did push this engine uh, pretty hard all the time and it took it like a champ but there are some challenges when it comes to bike carb conversions and we will talk about them in this video the next thing we'll be of course talking about is the new engine which has seen a lot of progress since last time last time we just had a engine block put together now we have pretty much everything on the engine the head the transmission uh, and the engine is pretty much ready to be installed now, because I don't have any animations or graphs to show you, instead I'll be showing you a time-lapse footage of me and my friend removing the old engine from the MR2. But uh, actually, no. Uh, before that, before that, uh, because I don't do update videos very often, I like to use the opportunity to cram as much info into them as possible. So just two quick little uh, pieces of info. As uh, some of you already know, I have started doing live streams using the Super Peer platform. This is a very... Uh, intuitive, user-friendly, simple platform. There's a lot of people uh, on there uh, as well. We have already done two live streams. I have really enjoyed them. Uh, honestly, it's a really nice way to connect uh, with everybody on a more personal, more, uh, I don't know, friendly level. We basically hang out and talk together and uh, the two live streams so far have been really, really fun. Uh, a lot more fun than I honestly expected. The people who have been on the live streams also claim they have they had fun. So if they're not lying, uh, it is fun. So um, what do we do? We talk about car, car guy stuff in general. We discuss various topics. You can head to the link below and you can see uh, uh, the topics we have planned for the future. So it isn't just, you know, friendly chatting. We also have some use out of it and that is uh, I'm doing Q&A sessions. The next one will be, the next live stream will be a Q&A session where we together uh, troubleshoot various potential issues with your engine builds or your project cars or whatever. So together, you know, more heads are cleverer than one head or whatever. So yeah, fun stuff. Definitely consider uh, becoming a member. Uh, links are below. The other uh, thing that uh, I still get messages about is whether I'm still selling my 4AGE crankshaft sensor brackets, I made a post about this, I'm not selling them anymore, uh, but people still keep asking me, I still get messages on Instagram, I'm not selling them anymore. I have made the CAD files available for a very, very modest price, and you can purchase that again below through a another platform called Fourth Wall. Uh, if you head there, you also have the opportunity to donate to the channel or buy a funny t-shirt or a mug. Of course, all of this goes towards supporting the channel and improving uh, the quality and quantity uh, uh, of my videos. So those are uh, the two little pieces of information that I wanted to share like this because sometimes I put them in posts but a lot of people miss the posts. So here they are in the video. Now let's get back to the removal of the old engine. Now when it comes to removing the engine I have to say that uh, I have learned to appreciate car lifts. We removed the engine uh, in under an hour. I think around 15 minutes. Uh, last time, the last two times, I did this by myself and uh, I did it with in my garage using, of course, I don't have a car lift. I used wood to stack up the car, nothing but wood. And this is an absolute, absolute pain. A car lift makes life so much easier and I appreciate it so much. So the engine was out and, and like, I don't know, it felt like nothing. And I would usually take with the wood around... I don't know, four to five hours because, and then getting it, you know, dragging it from under the car. I don't want to be reminded of all that stuff. So uh, getting the engine out was super, super easy. Now, when it comes to the bike carb engine after 5,000 kilometers, what can I say? Uh, for most, the stuff that I said initially after I drove the engine for about a month uh, still stands. This is not a thing you should be doing for your daily driver. Uh, the reason is that, uh, there might be troubleshooting, tuning, might not be super, super simple, and your mileage will suffer, your MPG will suffer. Uh, my average uh, MPG or fuel consumption was around, honestly, 
around 15 liters per 100 kilometers because oh, you, you can get it over, you can get it to around 10 liters per 100 kilometers. That's here's you can get the MPG numbers on the screen, uh, but you have to drive like like granny super super slow the moment you start pushing this the mpg goes through the window especially if you're in the city and you're pushing it from one traffic light to the other horrible horrible mpg i don't know where you you know depending on where you live of course fuel prices differ around the world but if you live in a place uh, where fuel isn't that cheap um, the bicarb thing might be annoying in the in the long run the other main issue that I discovered after only quite some time is that it changes the, the way your car drives and feels. Most importantly, it changes uh, the way your throttle feels and how you command the car with the throttle. And that's because, that's because of this right here. Just give me a second. I just gotta remove the throttle position sensor. Now, I don't know how well we can see this, but this little thing, uh, is your throttle wheel onto which the throttle cable attaches. Its diameter is basically this much. And that's because bike carbs are designed, the throttle is designed to be operated by hand because obviously these come from a motorcycle. A Honda CBR uh, 600 uh, uh, F4, I believe, these ones were from that bike. So obviously the throttle on a motorcycle is designed to be operated by your hand. Uh, and it has a different amount of travel and the throttle wheel is going to be uh, a lot smaller than the wheel uh, on, on from your car's um, throttle. So, and this is going to change the amount that your throttle pedal is going to travel. In my case, the difference between the throttle wheel on my carbs and the throttle wheel on my stock throttle body from the original 4HEE engine wasn't so bad, but still it reduced the throttle travel by about... I don't know, 30% is what I what it felt like. And this changed um, the way the car behaved and the throttle became sort of a on off thing. There's a lot of initial resistance to the throttle to get it moving. I guess that's how, you know, a hand is different than a foot. Basically, that's it. And the throttle would feel like a on off button. And this is a bit annoying. Usually it's not that bad. You get used to it after some time. But in some situations, it is particularly annoying. For example, uh, when I did my snow driving slash drifting video, uh, the throttle on off feeling is, is a really bad thing because you really need to, you know, to accurately dose the throttle to have a very fine, you know, resolution through the to the throttle to, to be capable of controlling the car in the snow. A on off thing, you know, makes this very, very difficult. And in general, it also forces you sort of to drive the car aggressively because you press on the throttle and you have to press a lot to overcome the initial resistance. And then all of a sudden you're pressing half the throttle and you wanted to do like 20%. And you, you, you start feeling like you have to push the car all the time and it's actually kind of forcing you to be more aggressive. And that is kind of fun from time to time, but it is not ideal. A solution is to make a custom throttle wheel for the bike carbs. You cannot simply transplant the one from the car's throttle body because it doesn't fit. You have to make a new one or have it, you know, machined to fit. I didn't do this because I honestly couldn't find the time and I kind of got used to the, to the on-off feeling. But if you want to do throttle, you know, bike carbs long term, definitely you have to fit the same throttle wheel, the same diameter throttle wheel as it is uh, on the stock throttle body of the car on some cars this is a on some uh, carbs this is really bad because the throttle wheel is really really small and this will make your throttle travel you know throttle pedal travel about this long and that's just gonna be not fun at all the second issue you probably noticed is that i have a protective mesh on my uh bike carbs so why a protective mesh instead of a you know a uh, nice old filter. Well, that's because after about, I think, two months of driving, my filter ended up looking like this. Yes, that is a hole in my intake air filter. This happened <clears throat> because, uh, so if you decide to buy carbs, a warning, be careful what kind of air filter you get with them. When I was ordering the kit from Dan ST Engineering, there, there were two Piper Cross filter options available. This one, which is a more narrow one from the side, and a, another wider one, which was like this or so. 
I chose the more narrow one because the space in the engine bay of the MR2 isn't very generous, so I feared, you know, it wouldn't fit, it would be, you know, pressed against the, the, the rear firewall, so I got a, uh, this one, the, the more narrow air filter. But there's a problem with that. Uh, during the initial tuning stages of the bike carbs, you will often run pretty rich. In general, carburetors run richer than fuel injection, and when you floor it and release the throttle, there's going to be a lot of uh, fuel, gasoline fumes floating around, around the intake trumpet of the bike carbs. These fumes will over time soak and saturate the air filter foam. This will make the air filter foam uh, heavier, and the less capable of letting air through it, which will enable the carbs to suck on the foam. And if you floor it really hard, the sucking or the vacuum, whatever you want to call it, will be capable of ripping a piece off your air intake foam. This happened to me while driving. The result was the throttle, uh, the throttle, uh, there's a little CV throttle slide in front of this. Um, I can't show it to you, the camera won't be able to see it. Anyways, the foam got stuck and I felt like my throttle was stuck open for, I don't know, like five seconds. But then the engine ingested the foam and, you know, combusted it and there was no damage, fortunately, because it's just foam and can't hurt the engine. But I lost my air filter and I was not ready to use uh, it again because it was a, uh, you know, safety hazard. Getting your throttle stuck for a couple of seconds can be really bad. Fortunately, I was in a long straight in the middle of, uh, you know, the city. There was nobody around. So I just, you know, pressed the clutch in and, you know, let the car do its thing. Just, you know, coast, coast along until the throttle returned to normal. So if you decide to do bike carbs, this, the, 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 the narrow, small air filters, don't use these. Get a larger air filter that will leave enough space for the fuel gasoline fumes to circle around without soaking the filter too much. Now, uh, I know a lot of people running the larger uh, foams and nobody had any issues with them. I know another uh, small foam later, uh, a person got in touch with me, they had the same issue happen to them on the same spot. So these small narrow ones, no. Another issue that makes bicarbs unsuitable for a daily driver is that I couldn't get rid of a you know, bang that the engine made, actually the exhaust or the intake or the carbs that would pop during startup. So when cranking the engine and that's when the engine was hot. Usually this would happen at a gas station. I would come in with a warmed up engine onto a gas station, shut off the engine, put in fuel. And when I crank the engine to start the car again, there would be a very loud pop. I People were startled really often. It was kind of embarrassing uh, on many occasions, you know, but bleh. People see an old car, so they assume, oh, uh, whatever, junk. Anyways, uh, I couldn't get rid of it. And this is because uh, the speed, the speed of the cranking and the ignition advance during the cranking were unsuitable no matter what you would set. The only way I could get rid of the pop or it, it would either be a pop at the carbs or a bang at the exhaust, one of the two. And this is because... Uh, the ignition advance is either too little or too much for the, uh, for, the, for the cranking and you can't set it right. No matter what you do when the engine is warm, it would pop. I tried a, a billion different things, nothing works. The only solution was, and that's this, to when you shut off the engine, to reduce your idle, you do this with this setting here. This is your idle speed setting screw. So you reduce the idle. You crank the engine, the engine cranks, comes to life normally, it doesn't bang, but your idle is too low and then the engine wants to shut off, so you have to get out of the car again and reduce and bring uh, the idle back up again to around 900 to 1000 RPM is what I was idling at, usually sometimes 1100 uh, RPM. That's it, so you have to basically get in the car, start, you know, reduce idle, get in the car, start, get out of the car, bring idle back up, and which is obviously, you know, doing that at a gas station every time is annoying. So those are the cons. What about the pros? Well, the biggest pro is the sound. The sound is something really, really special, and you have to be, I try to make a bunch of videos. But you really 
have to be there inside the car to feel and hear the sound and it is really really nice and when you want to drive sporty and aggressive it really urges you on to keep going and it's a special sound and I will really miss it so if you want to enjoy uh, internal combustion soundtracks then bike carbs are a good idea. The other benefit is a throttle response. Even though I got a hard on off throttle, the response was fantastic. Let's say you're cruising at 3000 RPM, very light throttle, and then you suddenly want to go, you know, fast and you floor it. Response is going to be magnificent. The engine is going to be, you know, very eager. It's all going to happen in, in an absolute instant. And this does feel nice and aggressive. When it comes to power gains, some people will tell you that you might gain power with bike carbs. Uh, this is heavily heavily tuning dependent and it depends on how bad your stock uh, fuel injection setup is the old ancient fuel injection setups might be at a disadvantage slight disadvantage when it comes to power with bike cars but to make power with bike carbs alone you need an absolute uh, perfect tune which is going to be really hard to achieve and uh, i'm not sure if it can be done so if you're expecting power gains from bike carbs don't expect them what I did feel as a noticeable power gain was a uh, highway performance at high speed. So it speeds about one, 150 miles uh, kilometers per hour, uh, but the bike carbs performed really well. The car was responsive and it felt a lot, to, you know, like it had a lot more power than I actually had at high RPMs and high highway speeds. Why? Um, I have no idea. Maybe the rich running fuel condition uh, simply favors uh, these types of driving conditions. So if you want to try converting your car engine to run on motorcycle carburetors, then I say, you know, go ahead, but be aware of some of the potential issues. Uh, another potential pro uh, is that converting your engine to, uh, to carbs will introduce you to the beautiful mechanical world of carburetors. By modern standards, this is something obsolete, but carburetors are still a very ingenious device. It uses nothing but pure mechanical moving parts to feed the correct amount of fuel into the engine there's no sensors no no wiring no nothing these ones do have a throttle position sensor but that's you know it's not necessary you can a carburetor can run without any sort of sensor that's how lawnmowers scooters mopeds whatever uh, actually run uh, now if you do have previous experience with carburetors then i think you're more suitable for a bike car project because any experience uh, you know, even if it's just a lawnmower or moped or whatever, uh, fiddling around with carburetors will make, will minimize the initial frustration you might uh, experience uh, when you start a project like this uh, if you have zero previous experience with carburetors. So some previous experience will definitely, definitely help. So beautifully mechanical, uh, giving the correct amount of fuel. Speaking of the correct amount of fuel, um, correct amount of fuel uh, in my case I made the best power at wide open throttle uh, with an air fuel ratio of 12.5 so around there it's ever steady 12.5 but like when 12.3 to 12.8 or so at wide open throttle I confirmed the air fuel ratio with my AM wideband uh, O2 sensor and I did confirm that this was best power on the dyno as well we changed jets the main jets on the dyno to reduce uh, the air fuel ratio to bring it up towards around 13.1, uh, 13.2, which should be best for a naturally aspirated engine. I lost power uh, uh, with that air fuel ratio. You know, carburetors, there's going to be some things that aren't straightforward, straightforward with them, and the maximum power I could achieve was 134 horsepower. That's it. Even though I had slightly upgraded cams and the carburetors, that's the maximum power I could achieve. Uh, they did increase torque pretty substantially, which is which is definitely something I could feel myself as well in the responsiveness in the engine. Uh, even in the low RPM, uh, there was the engine felt more lively with the carbs than with the stock uh, fuel injection. When it comes to the ignition advance, the best power I made uh, was uh, at around 42 degrees of ignition advance at wide open throttle uh, and anything beyond around uh, five and a half thousand RPM. That was my ignition advance. We tried lower and higher at the dyno. Again, this is what made the most power in my particular case and your particular case might be completely different. So just some info out there as a potential reference. So that's the bike carb engine uh, goodbye. I did want to actually um, do a final goodbye driving video, but I couldn't because my timing belt looks like this. 
Yeah, uh, this happened because one of the small bolts that holds the timing cover backing plate on the 4AGE engine loosened itself. It fell down at the bottom of the timing cover, got embedded in there and slowly ground away my timing belt. I drove a lot with a belt like this, wide open throttle, anything, it didn't snap. So I am a very lucky person. Now on to the new engine. So what was done in the meantime? Head gasket installed. It was a custom head gasket that Midship Garage provided for me because I couldn't get one from Cometic due to massive delays due to, I don't know, pandemic, global shipping, increased shipping. I, I have no idea. Uh, ever since I started Project Underdog, the whole pandemic thing has been making massive delays in the project. We were supposed to have the engine started around January this year. So uh, we're already uh, more than a month, almost two months behind schedule because whatever I order and I need a bunch of different parts from different places around the world, Europe really doesn't have almost anything. So I order a lot of stuff from the US and everything keeps getting delayed. I don't know if it's increased to, you know, shipping costs from China. Everybody is telling me it's that. So people wait to have a full container and then they ship and then they delay. And I have no idea whether it's the chip shortage, whether it's, I, I don't know, but it's killing me. Everything is constantly being delayed. And so, so they delay it once, then they delay it again. Uh, I waited for my injectors for, it was supposed to be like, they were out of stock and they were supposed to be uh, back in stock in two weeks. It ended up being a month and a half, uh, a bunch of other things. Anyways, delays constantly. But uh, we are, the engine is fully assembled. The head gasket uh, is on, on uh, has been installed. The head has been installed. We're using bone stock cams. Uh, a lot has been done to the head. Um, th this will be covered in detail uh, in a future video. I have been using for the uh, head studs, I have been using for a GE head studs, but be warned, you will have to modify these and you will have to shorten the studs if you use for a GE ARP head studs on a 4A FE engine. I think two of the studs uh, had to be uh, shortened. We have replaced all the valves, intake and exhaust, as well as the valve guides. This is important because the clearance between the valves and the valve guides was over spec, but the, the valves were loose. This is very uh, bad for a turbo engine because it ruins heat transfer between the valve and the valve guide. And then, then from the valve guide to the head, if the heat, heat transfer isn't sufficient, then your valve is going to be toast pretty soon. So that was replaced. Uh, cams are in. Uh, everything is stock regarding the cams. We have set the valve clearance. Uh, the valve cover is also on. As you as you can see, the engine, I have gone for a very uh, DIY look on the engine. I'm, you know, the older I'm getting, the less I care about red wrinkle finish and painting, painting everything into, you know, this or that color or the whole aesthetic thing of an engine. I, I know I might be boring and it isn't really flashy or useful for social media or whatever, but we just cleaned everything up and whatever is aluminum was just cleaned and left, you know, bare. Uh, the block was painted to prevent rust and that's it. So basic, simple, clean aesthetics, nothing fancy because honestly, I did a lot of fancy stuff on my bicarb engine and we, I powder coated stuff and all of this. And after about, you know, a month of driving, it's all dirty and, you know, it, it's just for a nice picture. Uh, off, you know, on, on social media and I kind of did that. So I, I really don't want to do it again. I'm basically saving money on these aesthetics and putting money into parts, into good hardware, into making the engine perform. I want this engine to drive, to perform and to be a good base for boost school because this engine is going to be what we're going to be tuning from A to Z, from zero to finish throughout uh, the entire future boost school video. So we're going to be tuning everything from AFR target maps to boost control to ignition maps to, to cranking maps to, uh, I don't know, you name it. We're going to do everything step by step and we're going to go in detail into the whole tuning process of a boosted engine. There's going to be a lot of videos in that. The exhaust manifold is in. We have the correct studs for the turbo. The exhaust manifold is, is as you know, from weld speed. Uh, I think everybody who walked into the, the mechanic shop, uh, the engine is finished and it's now sitting there waiting to be sold to the car. So anyone who walks to pick up their car sees the exhaust manifold if he or she is a car person. Oh, where did you get this? I want one of these. Can you make one of these for me? You know, yada, yada, yada. So after a while, we wrote, we wrote on a piece of paper on the exhaust manifold, it's from Australia. 
after the head was on we also installed uh, the clutch this is a mrp upgrade the clutch to handle all the extra power we're essentially trying to triple the stock power output the goal is uh, 300 horsepower whether that will be possible with the stock cams uh, we will see but the goal is 300 horsepower and the man on racing uh, clutch is definitely more than capable of handling that uh, the flywheel is a brand new toyota uh, blacktop uh, lightened flywheel uh, it, it is lightened from the factory compared to the uh, stock uh, 4 ag 16 valve flywheel so it's a nice compromise between a overly light flywheel and something uh, overly heavy bone stock so it's a part you can get still brand new from toyota uh, and it's a good idea on most you know engines that are going to see a mix of street and track let's say after that we of course installed the transmission the transmission is an e51 uh, toyota uh, mr2 mark one supercharged transmission this is the internals are basically identical to the Toyota SW20, the later model E153 transmission. So it's a really, really strong transmission. It's really, um, uh, we rebuilt it, new synchros, uh, new bearings where we had to, a bunch of new stuff. Uh, finding parts for this transmission is really, really hard. Um, full rebuild kits are either non-existent or, or they cost more than, than you know, if, uh, the car, I don't know, like, two thousand dollars is what i what i found for a full rebuild kit it, uh, i was like no um but we rebuilt it with oem parts we purchased whatever we could find uh so the transmission should perform pretty well it has an you know like an built-in stock oiling system so it's, it's it's pretty good pretty well engineered pretty strong and it's capable of most people say around 600 horsepower so it's gonna be more than enough uh for me the gear ratios aren't perfect but they're good they're good i'm gonna be happy with them the transmission also has a Quaife ATB limited slip differential or automatic torque biasing differential, whatever you want to call it. Some people say it's not a limited slip differential, whatever. Um, I think it is. It's just, it is. It's, it's a torsen. Basically, it's a torsen. Uh, it's a torsen differential uh, that's in, also provided uh, by Midship Garage. Um, they managed to get one of those uh, for me. Really happy about that. It's going to be really important for because of all the extra added torque generated uh by the engine by the turbocharged engine i think the stock open differential would kind of you know limit the potential of the build so the transmission is on the engine is basically complete the next stage is going to be uh engine mounts i expected the engine mounts somehow for some reason i didn't do any research i'm really ashamed i expected the engine mounts you know for the e51 the stock aw11 naturally aspirated transmission the the c50 and c52 i expected those transmission mounts to just be the same as on the e51 supercharged mr2 mark one transmission they're not we're gonna have to modify all three of the uh, of the transmission mounts we already uh, finished one that one that one was pretty easy the one on the driver's side of the car if your car is a left hand drive that one is already done we're gonna have to do the front and the rear one they don't seem to be too difficult um, overall the difference is that the, the supercharged Toyota MR2 Mark 1 seems to have the whole engine a bit higher in the engine bay for some reason I have no idea but they moved everything a bit higher and the mounts on the transmission itself are kind of different so but we're gonna we're gonna get that uh, done uh, uh, sooner or later and the next step after that is going to be wiring in uh, all my AEM stuff. We're going to be running the AEM 506 Infinity ECU together with an AEM uh, uh, digital dash, the larger model with the logging. And this is going to be uh, absolutely key for Boost School. We're going to log all the data. We're going to see what works, what doesn't. We're going to learn through all of this logging and see how different changes in the maps and the tune impact, you know, how the car and the engine behaves and power and torque and, you know, heat and everything. It's going to be super fun. It's basically... All of the stuff I've been talking about uh, in my videos about boost and engines and you know so on and so forth in theory that I have present, presented with animations and graphs we're gonna do now we're gonna explore now in practice through a concrete engine and car uh, example combo and modern tuning software so hopefully I don't know mid spring the first start should happen or you know beginning of spring it was supposed to be winter but again massive delays due to parts shortage so yeah that's pretty much it for today's video uh 
as I already said, consider joining the live streams. It's going to be fun. We can talk like this, you know, and much more. It's going to be back and forth. So whatever you wanted to ask me while watching this video, you can ask me during the live stream immediately and then we can, you know, go back and forth. You can also join. The, uh, why, what I really like about uh, the Super Peer is that people can actually come on screen and join the live stream. It's an actual dialogue. It's not just me talking for an eternity and being, you know, a monologue and you just chatting. You can actually, you know, get a webcam and, and you know, basically we're hanging out face to face. And, and during the, one of the last stream, last streams, people did come, you know, on stage and we talked. And I really, really like that because just just comments and written words is actually, you know, personal a personal connection with the people who are watching the videos. And that really just, uh, you know, uh, to someone who's making all these videos and putting all the effort, that really feels feels really, really special, and it really gives a a whole new dimension uh, to to this whole thing that I'm doing. So yeah, that's pretty much it for today. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you have any questions, if I forgot something, uh, you know, about the build, if you have uh, anything else you want to ask, hit up the comment section. Uh, and I'll be seeing you soon with more fun and useful stuff on the D4A channel.